December 7th, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. Costly to our Navy was the loss of war vessels, airplanes, and equipment. But more costly to Japan was the effectiveness of its foul attack in immediately unifying America in its determination to fight and win the war thrust upon it and to win the peace that will follow. A few days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, a man named Abraham Maslow drives home through the streets of Brooklyn. He's in his early 30s, but his neat mustache and slack jowls make him look older. Or maybe it's the tweed jacket, an occupational hazard. He's a professor at Brooklyn College. Maslow rounds a corner and slows to a stop. His path is blocked. A ragtag parade stumbles past his windshield. Earnest Boy Scouts and men in worn out uniforms doing their bit to support the war effort. Someone waves a flag. Someone else tries to keep up on a flute. A funny thing happens to Maslow as he sits there watching. He starts to cry. It's not the parade that upsets him. It's the sudden realization that in this most terrifying historic moment, none of us has a clue. We know we want to beat the Germans and the Japanese, but we have no idea who they are or what motivates them. For that matter, we don't even understand ourselves. And until we figure that out, he thinks, we're doomed to endless war. When the parade thins to nothing, he races home and starts to write. Over the following days and weeks and years, he works out a grand theory of human motivation. It grounds all of our impulses, all of our deeds, in a simple hierarchy of needs. First are survival needs, like food, water, shelter, and safety. Next are social and emotional needs, like belonging and self-esteem. And then, only then, can we fulfill the highest need of all to live up to our potential, whether by making music or starting a business or caring for others. Maslow calls it self-actualization. A hierarchy of needs may sound academic, but the idea catches on. Organizations around the country embrace it, then simplify it, presenting it as a pyramid. And the only way to get to the top is by climbing up from the bottom. Three years after Maslow unveils his theory, the U.S. government launches the National School Lunch Program to make sure school kids get the sustenance they need. A nutritious lunch helps a child stay alert. It helps teenagers make that final spurt of growth that develops them into healthy grown-ups. It gives all youth the energy to keep up and grow up. And what better use for our cultural riches than the school lunch? It's pure Maslow. Because without full stomachs, how can children grow to be productive members of society? Meanwhile, other institutions set their sights higher up on the pyramid. Businesses start to focus on meeting the social and psychological needs of their workers. Advertisers target the emotional needs of potential customers. Schools move away from rote teaching to focus on needs like self-esteem and personal growth. And everyone, from barefoot gurus to gray-suited management consultants, preaches the gospel of self-actualization. We've got three days to do the three acts of self-actualization. Let me give you an overview of where we're going to go on this journey. Today is a construct. The hierarchy is optimistic. It's not about sin and redemption or duty and sacrifice. It's about meeting our needs and improving ourselves. It makes perfect sense for a country full of energy and hope. But times change, and so do our needs. Even Maslow, at the end of his life, has his doubts about the hierarchy. Sure, he thinks it's important to be the best that we can be. But wouldn't it be better if we could get beyond ourselves? If we could use our creative potential to connect with and lift up humanity? Wouldn't it be better if we could truly transcend? If you're interested in the story behind the business headlines, check out Big Technology Podcast, my weekly show that features in-depth interviews with CEOs, researchers, and reformers in business and technology. Hi, I'm Alex Kantrowitz. I'm a longtime journalist, CNBC contributor, and the host of the show. I empty my Rolodex every Wednesday to bring you awesome episodes. So go check out Big Technology Podcast. It's available on all podcast apps. We'd love to have you as a listener. 
From Wondery, I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. I founded The Next Big Idea Club with Malcolm Gladwell, Susan Cain, Daniel Pink, and Adam Grant to connect people to some of the boldest thinking shaping our culture and our future. Each week on the podcast, we bring you one idea with the power to change the way you see the world. This week, Achieving Transcendence. Psychologist Scott Barry Kaufman spent years poring through Abraham Maslow's diaries, lecture notes, and unpublished essays. It turns out Maslow was never fully satisfied with his famous hierarchy. For one thing, he never conceived of it as a pyramid, and the whole idea of self-actualization, where we find out who we are and set out to do what we were meant to do, that was fine as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Even better would be to erase the boundaries that separate us from other people in the world and to achieve a sort of communion. Maslow called the state transcendence, but he never fully fleshed it out. That's what Scott sets out to do in his latest book, Transcend, The New Science of Self-Actualization. He also proposes a new metaphor to replace the popular pyramid built on the idea of life as a journey, even an adventure, and not an uphill slog. Scott has a PhD from Yale and has taught at Columbia, NYU, and the University of Pennsylvania. He's also the host of the Psychology Podcast. Just a quick vocabulary lesson before we start. Key to understanding Scott's system of human motivation is understanding the difference between what he calls deprivation values, or D values, and being values, or B values. Again, that's D for deprivation and B for being. D values are driven by things we lack, like food or safety or social connection. B values are driven by a deep affection for the being of others. They're characterized by a generosity of spirit. They drive us towards our most elevated objectives, love, truth, beauty. Scott Barry Kaufman, it is wonderful to have you on the Next Big Idea podcast. Oh, it's so great to be here. And it's even more beautiful to be able to have this conversation with someone that I consider to be a friend. I mean, we it's not like we've known each other that long, Scott, but I have a category, which is the future close friend category. <laughs> and you are in that category. I love that. I think I love that. <laughs> Does that mean we're not like close friends yet, but it's on the trajectory? Yeah, I mean, we're pretty, you know, we're we're friends, <laughs> but I think I think we're on yeah, a path yeah. towards being like future close friends. You know what I mean? Yes, I hear you. I hear you. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, well, this is part of why I know to properly introduce you as the notorious SBK. I would never refer to myself as such. That would be hokey. Right. But feel free to call me that. But you might quietly encourage others using the phrase. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, for sure. Well, Scott, for those listeners who don't know about your work, can you share a bit about your journey prior to this book, about how you got into the field of psychology, if this is a calling for you, and I think it is, what called you to this calling? Well, I've always been absolutely fascinated with human nature, but also human variation. And then trying to question and understand myself, because I was placed in special education for an auditory processing disability. So I was, I always felt like a, a couple milliseconds behind everyone else. And um, people noticed, you know, and uh, I think a lot of people thought I was stupid. And that confused me as well, because I felt like I was capable of more challenges than people gave me credit for. So a lot of this just all came together in my childhood and just made me just so fascinated with understanding the uh, intricacies of human nature and its variations. So you went from this path of being in the learning disabled category, effectively, or special needs, and aspiring to get into the gifted sections in high school, and then actually applying to college with a personal essay that was about wanting to redefine how we measure intelligence. Yeah, it started off with like, what does it take to achieve in life? You know, this kind of thing and talking about our standard metrics and how we need to have a broadened view of intelligence. But I actually didn't get accepted into the psychology program as an undergraduate. Although you sung your way in. That's right. I I went to the opera department and sang my heart out and I was accepted to the same school that had rejected me for psychology. I was accepted on a partial scholarship for my voice abilities. Which are manifest 
as we speak. Yeah. Uh, I which, may or may which, not have had too much coffee today. So <laughs> if I get too cheeky, please rein me in. No, no, no. We embrace cheekiness. And so your latest book is inspired by the work of Abraham Maslow. I think most people listening have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, this basic idea that we have to address our basic physiological needs, like the need for food, shelter, large volumes of toilet paper, high-speed internet, before we can address higher level needs, moving up to love, belonging, self-esteem, self-actualization. Yeah. But you make the case that his hierarchy of needs has been misunderstood. Effectively, what we've ended up with is a caricature of this really kind of complex model that he that he put forth. Big time, big time. Because people may have seen this hierarchy of needs, even if they have never even heard of Abraham Maslow, they've seen it on the internet. But he never drew a pyramid. I mean, no one knows that. <laughs> like Very few people know that because it's in most introductory psychology textbooks and management textbooks depicted as a pyramid. It, in fact, he, he argued that human development was constantly this two-step forward, one-step back dynamic where we're constantly striving for growth, but we're constantly falling on our ass, you know? And it's like, that's part of life. Life is not a video game. Like you reach a certain minimum threshold of connection and then some voice from above is like, congrats, you've unlocked esteem. And then you can like go <laughs> up that. and um, level three and never have to worry about connection ever again. At any moment in our lives, we can revert back, you know, just being hungry. All of a sudden, everyone looks like a hamburger to us. Like, or if we're vegetarian, everyone looks like uh, broccoli to us. But, <laughs> but the point is, Whenever you're severely deprived of a need, you want to conform the world onto your own uh, deprivations to satisfy your own whole and your soul. So if you're severely deprived of connections, everyone looks like a friend, you become desperate for friends. However, when you can enter this being realm that Maslow talked about, the being realm of yes. human existence or the growth realm, the whole world opens up. The world's beautiful in the being realm. It's ugly in the deprivation realm. And most people live their whole lives in the deprivation realm, don't even realize there's beauty mm. that they missed out on. And that thing, that's tragic. I think it's tragic for any human being to have to go their whole lives not realizing um, the meaningfulness that could exist in the world if they could transcend their deprivations. One of the things that is, I think, so powerful for readers of your book, Scott, is to experience vicariously this kind of communion that you had with Maslow in the course of researching this book. Right? The dedication of the book reads, this book is dedicated to Abraham Harold Maslow, a dear friend I have never met. And in his final years after a heart attack, Maslow wrote in his journal, the way I feel now, I just don't feel up to writing all the things I feel I ought to. I wouldn't mind dying as a result, but I just don't have the stamina. So the thought is to save it in all these little memos in these journals and the right person will come and know what I mean and why it must be done. When you read those words, Scott, you must have been thinking, he is speaking to me. I did. Um, <laughs> just Bluntly, I did. I felt uh, like, you know, this a sense of responsibility to kind of uh, set the record straight on a lot of misconceptions about self-actualization and, and even transcendence, dare I say. You introduce in this book a new metaphor for the hierarchy of needs. Can you tell us about your sailboat metaphor? Yeah, so I think that it's, it's better to or more in line with Maslow's spirit of Maslow's notion of self-actualization, to view self-actualization as an ongoing journey through the vast unknown of the sea. When we have a boat that is not secure, so our basic needs aren't met, we can't move anywhere. So it's really important, I want to emphasize that we must not neglect our basic needs. So you need the boat to be secure, or else you don't go anywhere. But you eventually, if you want to go anywhere, you need to be vulnerable and open up that sail and really face the unknown of the sea, well, with your your passions and your values and your purpose. You move through life with intention and mindfulness. Among the things I take from it is this notion that, you know, a sailboat, I'm thinking of a traditional sort of wooden sailboat, you know, the hull requires maintenance, right? You have to, every year you have to take it out of the water and you've got to, you've got to work on it, you know, so so there's a process of attending to the hull making sure you have this fundamental security. And as you point out, that's just the starting place, but you have to have that starting place. It's critical. Yeah. And then I also love this association of opening up the sale, right? That to open up as a human is a little bit, 
always feels a little bit risky, and yet it's deeply gratifying. Yeah, the ideal life is to to move full steam ahead, putting your your entire being into whatever you your highest purpose. And that's really what this book is about at the end of the day, or, or what, what I'm all about at the end of the day, is not defining ourselves by one slice of ourself. Um, so yeah, just put your whole being into it, and then don't judge people by their singular aspect of themselves. Don't, don't judge a person by their worst day. People tend to do that. If someone's having a bad day on Twitter, people are like, that's who that person is, and they're a horrible human being. But zoom out. Zoom out on people. You know, and also zoom out on yourself. You know, that's an interesting observation because is this it's, too it's, Oprah for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Scott, with a title like Transcend, we're already in Oprah territory. And that actually is, I think, worth talking about because I do think that transcendence can have kind of new agey associations. And even the phrase like self actualization, right, can read, I think, at first blush to many people as being a little bit. Um, Woo-woo. Well, uh, certainly as woo-woo or self helpy opposed to part of a rigorously scientific exploration. I've made this phrase, I, I've said this before in a talk, I said there's wisdom in the woo-woo. One of my aims is to put the woo-woo on a firm scientific foundation and see what works, what doesn't work, what's true, what's not true. I'm very curious. I'm not the kind of person who will prejudge something um, because of how it sounds. I'll want to test it. I'll want to see the, the utility value of it. So, yeah, this book is, the subtitle of this book is The New Science of Self-Actualization. So I try to back everything up as much as I can through evidence-based reasoning. But there's a lot of wisdom in the woo-woo sometimes. In Transcend, Scott writes, quote, I believe that a true integration of Eastern, Western, and indigenous philosophical notions of self-actualization is not only possible, but necessary for reaching the highest ceilings of human nature. So the quest to become the best version of yourself requires you to look everywhere for clues and accept insights from surprising sources. It requires radical openness, but where do you start? Hi, I'm DC Marshall. Hi, I'm Mita Malik. We are the co host of the Brown Table Talk podcast, where we discuss how to help women of color thrive in their workplaces. And we invite allies to join us to help women of color win at work. We have a seat waiting for you. Subscribe to Brown Table Talk wherever you enjoy podcasts. In Transcend, Scott Barry Kaufman introduces a new metaphor for the hierarchy of needs, a sailboat. There's a picture in his book, it looks like a kid may have drawn it. The body of the boat, the hull, is like a layer cake with safety on the bottom, then connection, then self-esteem. Above the hull is a triangular sail, and it's also sliced in three. The bottom is exploration, the middle is love, and the tip of the sail is purpose. For people listening to this, they can conceptualize this, this kind of reconceptualized hierarchy of needs where you have safety, connection, self-esteem, right, or the hull of the boat. And then we move up to exploration, love, and purpose. Uh, on a pragmatic level, how do you recommend to listeners that they think about building or optimizing their sailboat? Oh, well, first of all, not a big fan of optimization or hacking. Life is, is something to be experienced and uh, being open to exploration and the unknown and, and whatever could arise. If you if you work too hard on optimizing a moment, you're, you're quite likely to squash the moment, <laughs> to not mm -hmm. be aware of it, to not, to not savor it. Mm -hmm. You know, like life is to be savored. Mm. It's not to be hacked. So therein lies my practical advice because I don't think that there's any one true good life or path to self-actualization. You have to find what works for you and find your value system and, and, and commit commit to what your calling is going to be at, at this moment and put your entire being into it, but with a spirit of exploration, you know, that you, you might have to adjust the sales. You might have to adjust your 
your uh, your goals in order to to get there, to get where you want to go. But constantly being open to revision, mm-hmm. to uh, to finding meaning in your suffering. Mm-hmm. People who are obsessed with optimization, it's like they're they're like perfectionists. Like they can never can they fall on their butt, or else they like the falling on the butt is outside the realm of their optimization. But I think that. We need a model in which falling on one's butt is part of the optimization process. I love it. You're getting new quotes from SBK, the notorious SBK. <laughs> the notorious SBK. Uh, is, I'm, is just, I'm dropping. I'm dropping new shit right here. Just dropping so you know. them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one as we think about the hull of the boat, a comment of yours that I love is that the distinction between self-esteem and the esteem of others is wildly overstated. I think you would say, right? That basically, like, you know, the truth is that we are social animals. And connectedness is just f- totally fundamental to who we are. And it's very difficult to have self-esteem without that being meaningfully influenced by the esteem of others. And we should yeah. be investing in connection. Is part of the message I, I get from you. Is that, do you think that's true? I do. Uh, I, I talk a lot about the distinction between self-esteem and narcissism in the book. I've been really... Um, trying to scientifically distinguish between the two. And they're very different. They have very different developmental experiences. Um, so for instance, uh, narcissism tends to peak early, like in teen, 14, age 15, and decline throughout our lives. Whereas self-esteem, we often have low self-esteem at age 14 and 15. <laughs> and it peaks as we get older. Not only that, but um, in many different ways, the two diverge in their outcomes in life. Self-esteem is much more correlated with with having connections with others and getting um, usually a sense of healthy pride for the work you've done, as opposed to narcissism is an unhealthy pride for the work you haven't done. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Right. Totally. <laughs> Think about that. Think yeah. about that. The work you actually haven't earned. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I've I've always thought that. Well, can I write that confidence... down? I want to tweet that. Wait, I want to tweet that. Can you hold on? I won't tweet it right yeah. now, but I want to write it down. So t- <laughs> that was that was pure gold, pure SBK gold. Hold on, it, which is a narcissistic <laughs> thing to say, um, and I know it. The uh, notorious uh, SBK. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. What did I say? What did I say? Narcissism, self-esteem is usually the result of um, what did I say? Uh, well, uh, achievement. Healthy pride for what you've done, right? Yeah, yeah. For what you've done, whereas narcissism is usually the result of unhealthy pride for what you for haven't something done. for what you haven't done. Okay, good. That good. that twist at the end is what's so yes. great about it. The, the, for what that, you haven't done, I think in yeah. terms of tweets. Something I find interesting about your your observation that self esteem and esteem from others are really tightly correlated for almost all humans. Yeah. I think here you depart a little bit with sort of the, the cult of mindfulness. And I, I don't mean to use cult as a pejorative word here, although of course it is pejorative, but I think maybe your effort is better applied to being deeply connected with others, you know, and that, that, and that delivers, I mean, that effectively like self-esteem and esteem, these things are very tightly entwined. Yeah, the the goal of all this is is having a real integrated sailboat where all the different aspects and parts of the sailboat are working harmoniously together. That that's what a that's the point of all of this. It's not to um, be ashamed of your narcissistic tendencies so much that you just live your life in shame, or or to be uh, you know, or to say think so so bad to have self esteem. There there are people who you know talk about you know self esteem. We, we just be like the Buddha and have no self. Oh, come on, don't don't tell me that like the Dalai Lama doesn't know he's the Dalai Lama. <laughs> you know, like I, I, by the way, I love look. I love the Dalai Lama. So this is not this is no shade whatsoever on the Dalai Lama. The but you, he's, you know, he sits down for an interview. You know, he knows he's got a sense of str- he's got a very strong sense of self. It's not like he's no self. <laughs> you know, like, like like he knows like he knows I'm now being interviewed as the Dalai Lama, and I and he loves himself. In in a non narcissistic way, but I I would argue that it's a wonderful thing to have a strong sense of self. It's a wonderful thing mm. to truly love yourself. Those who love themselves mm. genuinely are are much more likely to have love for others who are different mm. than themselves. Yeah, uh, we found that over and over again in our research. Um, the problem is treating these things as dichotomies, as things that we need to sweep under the rug. No, it's integration. I would argue the Dalai Lama has a great integration. Mm. He has great uh, a great harmony. 
um, within himself. And that harmony is what it starts from within and it radiates outwards. A lot of people have great discord within, great, uh, they're fighting a civil war within themselves, and then they project that war onto everyone they meet, and they never, uh, yes. and they don't yes. realize it. They don't know they're doing that. Something else that, that I would say is that I think that for most people, and, and I think this is implicit in, in your book, there's a journey of moving from the D realm to the B realm, right? From more deficiency-motivated behaviors to more being motivated behaviors. Because I, I found this distinction between the D realm or deficiency realm and the B realm or being realm to be one of the most compelling and useful insights in the book, of which there are many. You know, everything in life has a D flavor to it and a B flavor to it. So nothing in it of itself, I think, is objectively good or bad. We can have self-deprecating humor, the deficiency-oriented humor, uh, that maybe even aggressive or disparaging humor where we make fun of other groups or other people. We can have more growth-oriented humor where it uplifts people, it, makes, it brings us together, it connects us as a species. There's B and D aggression. Mm. There's B and D belonging, where, you know, where you're desperately trying to belong to a group because you're lonely, as opposed to you belong to the group because you actually care about the group <laughs> right, and right. their goals. Right. It's not just selfishly because, like, please like me. I need to find someone that likes me. You know, it's because I have a lot of pride in that group. Um, you can go down the line and B and D politics, absolutely. A B and D religion. So I think, for instance, like, let's look at, I think for almost any of us, you look at our, our, our teenage years, our childhoods, and it's often a sense of deficiency that drives us to be realized, right? So I think there's this funny way in which self-loathing can be rocket fuel. You know, particularly in early stages of one's life. But the critical thing is to see that, hopefully, as it's happening and graduate to more mature motivations. This is such a good point. And maybe I, maybe I have it wrong. Maybe my whole book is wrong. <laughs> maybe, maybe, and I'm open to that. But yeah. believe it or not, I am actually open to the fact that everything I ever thought in my life is wrong could be wrong because that's part of mm. the enjoyment of the exploration of life. That's an extraordinary statement. Yeah. Thank you. But I think that the evidence suggests what I wrote in my book. But I think there's another part of the story which you point out and which I've thought about, mm. which is that I tend to be in my life, I tend to be most. Uh, I, at least in my 20s, I uh, was very demotivated mm -hmm. by wanting to prove people wrong. Yeah. Now, I think one can then ask the question, is being demotivated in that regard most conducive to your own personal growth, ultimately as a whole person? And what I write in my book would suggest, no, it's not conducive. It's not most, that's not the best and most optimal motivation mm -hmm. in one's life for growth. But it is a motivation, and in the short term, it can be a very powerful motivation. But uh, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and a word that comes up in your book that you talk about is compensatory behaviors, right? So let's take the example of my very nearly perfect oldest son, who did not self-identify as an athlete in his formative years, but his friends complimented his drawings and his tech proficiency. And as a consequence, he spent more time on his art and more time developing his computer capabilities because it gave him compensatory social status. Like he had a deficiency of social status because he wasn't an athlete and he compensated by doubly investing in these other areas, partly because the deficiency hurts, right? And so I think the power of that compensatory impulse is something that plays out in most people's lives. Yes. But I think we need to recognize what lies at the root of that motivation. It's the addiction to self-esteem. And that is problematic uh, from a whole organism growth perspective. When you're just motivated and, and, and driven to uh, your primary motivation is, is not for the thing in itself, but as a means to proving people wrong or a means to actually tear down others or to shatter someone else's perception. What you're doing is your whole life is just trying to defend this positive self-image you have of yourself. And that will not open you up to growth in the long term. I can almost guarantee that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One example I find fascinating is the case of Elon Musk. His childhood was brutal. 
He was beaten up by bullies daily. He was once thrown down the stairs, hospitalized for a week with a concussion. He took refuge in comic books that depicted astronauts flying on rockets to Mars. Fast forward 25 years and Elon Musk is building rockets to fly us to Mars. Well, is it to save humanity or is it to save 12-year-old Elon Musk who was bullied at school? Or, or maybe both, right? It almost strikes me this is a case of like a deficiency motivation that maybe grows in adulthood into a being, you know, more transcendent motivation. Oh, it's just an amazing question because it probably a mix. I mean, there's no, it, it's hard to argue that he'd be entirely motivated by the self-esteem and the, the grandeur of, of accomplishing such a thing for humanity alone. That, that, that alone won't push you through all the hard work and lots of setbacks and things that he's encountered because there's an awful lot of things he's done that he's not gotten high praise That's true. Right, from others That's true. and he still perseveres. Yep. But there might be something there. I I, I have a, a really vulnerable admission, extremely vulnerable admission. When I was 10 years old, 11 years old, when I was taking showers, I used to close my eyes and dream of giving a talk in front of thousands of people about self-actualization. Wow. And I had dreams about, uh, not just not dream, real daydreams, mm, daydreams. Yeah. Um, I, I remember I would be in the shower and I would transform into, um, well, who I am today, <laughs> which Amazing. is really eerie, yeah. really eerie. But the context surrounding that kid at age 11 is that I was in special education. And one school psychologist told my mom that I had delusions of grandeur because I wanted to grow up to be an academic psychologist someday. So you know what? Fuck people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, that, right. Honestly, honestly, yeah. if you have a dream, uh, you know, people can scrutinize Elon Musk. I'm not going to be that person who's going to nitpick Elon, Elon Musk and say, well, is he narcissist? You know, good for Elon Musk. He realized I, I'm with you. a dream that he had. Yeah, And I think we should be encouraging more people to have ambition and to have, quote, grandeur mm. in their lives without writing them off as delusional. This brings us to another topic that's of great interest to me, which you talk about, which is the agency versus communion trade-off. Where is that, and I know you hate the word optimal, but that optimal zone, right, of being <laughs> connected in a transcendent way to the needs of humanity, but at the same time, kind of practical and focused enough on your own ends to actually get stuff done. You know, life is is this balance between being and doing. And I think it's best that when we are doing, that we're, what we're doing is emanating from our being. And sometimes there are things that really get in the way. There, there, there are people who want to thread in our being. I mean, let's be realistic. A lot of people in our society today are, are uh, disadvantaged, face a lot of racism, discrimination. They don't feel like their being is protected in our society. And so um, they need to fight. Uh, they need to fight for their existence. They need to fight to be viewed as fully human. And so that's that's really important to recognize that as well. In his book, Scott says something amazing happens when you perfect that balance between being and doing. Your prime for experience is so powerful they can reshape who you are as a human being. Scott calls them peak experiences, moments when we enter a higher level of consciousness and communion with the world. And they're easier to come by than you may think. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and Incitro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. It's June 2017. 
a bright blue morning in California's Yosemite Valley. 2,000 feet up, Alex Honnold clings to the slippery granite face of El Capitan, pondering an obstacle known as the boulder problem. To get past it, he'll need to execute a perfectly choreographed sequence of moves. You've got your right hand on a crimp, left hand on a side pull, and then you put your right foot onto this dimple thing. That's Honnold describing his routine in the 2018 documentary, Free Solo. Right hand goes up to a small down pulling crimp, left foot goes into a little dish, and then you drive up off the left foot into the thumb press. That's the worst hold on the entire route, so you get maybe half your thumb on the hold. Then you roll your two fingers. Honnold has climbed this section before, more than 60 times, in fact. But today is different because today he's up here alone and without ropes. He dips his hand into the pouch of chalk that dangles around his waist. Then he swings his left foot out wide, hammering it into an adjacent corner. His legs splayed at a 90 degree angle are the only things keeping him from plummeting to certain death. He reaches left and pulls his entire body sideways. Then he scrambles up to a minuscule perch. He's got another thousand feet to go, but it feels like the weight of the world has lifted. I felt like the mountain was offering me a victory lap. It all felt like a celebration. And then I reached the summit after three hours and 56 minutes of glorious climbing. It was the climb that I wanted, and it felt like mastery. Halfway around the planet, a climber stands on the summit of Mount Everest. She sees mountain peaks in every direction like jagged sugar cubes jabbing at an impossibly blue sky. The world is quite literally laid out at her feet. Climbers who've been here say there's nothing like it. It's terrifying and exhilarating, the peak of peak experiences. But in this case, it's not real. The climber isn't climbing at all. She's in an air conditioned room wearing a virtual reality headset. But researchers have found the feeling she gets, the sense of awe and wonder and connection, is totally legit. Scott Barry Coffin says we don't need to risk our lives on a sheer rock face or scale the world's highest mountain to achieve transcendence. Peak experiences are out there waiting for us. We can find them on a walk in the woods or in an armchair with a good book. We just have to open ourselves up to them. Scott, I was really happy to see that you endorse adventure seeking. What are the virtues of adventure seeking? Um, adventure seeking is is part of the explorative drive that we have as humans and can help us master and challenge things that we might fear, that we're really scared of. Um, I, I, I try to look at examples of very queer adventure seekers like Alex Honnold is a great mm-hmm. example of that. He didn't do what he did just for the adrenaline rush. If anything, it, it was so calculated. He did every little step so that when he would do the main thing, he wouldn't have fear. He wouldn't have that adrenaline rush. He really was doing it for that that flow state that Mazo called a peak experience mm. um, where you're fully in the moment. And I think all of us can relate to that and how beautiful it feels to, uh, how wonderful everything seems to just make sense when we're deeply absorbed in something uh, and uh, we have no self-critical thoughts um, and nothing else matters. We're not thinking about our emails. We're not thinking about pleasing anyone. It's a big one. It's hard to get in the flow state when you're so concerned about pleasing someone. What, one thing that struck me as, uh, as fascinating is the human experience of awe, I think of as kind of visceral and unmeasurable. But of course, intrepid psychologists have attempted to measure it. And Keltner and Haight in a 2003 paper concluded that there are two main cognitive appraisals central to the awe experience. The first is the perception of vastness, and the second is the struggle to mentally process the experience, which I thought was kind of great. Yeah. And then you went on to create a scale based on the various aspects of awe. So this is this is something you've dug into. Yeah, I've done some work with my colleague, uh, David Yaden, uh, and self-transcendence. And self-transcendent experiences are on a continuum from that kind of flow state I was talking about, where you're deeply absorbed in, in what you're doing in, so, in a task, to being in love, the love experience, to being inspired, 
um, to uh, awe, which we're, we're talking about now, and uh, having almost reverence mm. for for something outside of yourself. Mm. To all the way to the right of the spectrum, we get the mystical experience, which uh, isn't so frequent. So let's talk about reaching this higher plane that your book kind of culminates with. How do we go about achieving transcendence or, uh, you know, the phrase I like is becoming fully human? Yeah. So Maslow in the end of his life realized that self-actualization is not enough, um, that there's a higher motivation. He looked at self-actualizing people and he realized there's actually two different types of self-actualizing people. There are the self-actualizers who are obsessed with hacking and optimizing and realizing their full potential but they don't really care about realizing the full potential of society. They don't care, care that much about contributing to the good society. They're just so f- head down focused on maybe getting bigger biceps hmm. or getting more money at work. And then they're the, the, the type of uh, self-actualizing person called the transcenders. Dun, 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 dun. And the transcenders were those that he said were very regularly motivated by the B values in life, the values of pure being, things like truth, goodness, uh, meaningfulness, aliveness, perfection, simplicity, elegance, excellence. Well, people who are motivated by the B values in life, there's nothing uh, more. You don't have these values so that you could get anything else. They are ends in and of themselves. Engaging in beauty is beautiful for the sake of beauty, not for the sake of extracting something from someone else to satisfy some deep deficiency in your soul. And that transcenders are also motivated by peak experiences, by the most wondrous moments in life, by these moments of of feeling deeply, deeply connected to the rest of humanity. And yeah, he 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 really discovered that like there's a higher motivation in the hierarchy of needs. The highest motivation is not self actualization; it's transcendence. This notion of the of transcendence as a continuum, going from flow state to love to awe and then peak and mystical experiences. I completely relate with that as a wearing my kind of the artist hat or the experiential hat. From a scientific perspective, aren't these value judgments that we humans are placing on human experiences of consciousness and the notion that peak and mystical experiences, right? I mean, I mean some, some, a contrarian might say, well, wait a second, you know, if someone has a peak mystical experience in the woods and comes back out with a mandate to invite all husbands to have six wives, which sort of happened with the Mormon religion. I mean, I I think there are contrarians who would say, you know what, there have been some consequences in history that maybe some people would see as positive and others would make the case were quite negative. The contrarian would say it's actually a failure of like processing you know that results that results in some of these transcendent experiences what what do you say to that again david yeden he's he's done great work on this he has this paper um a review paper really dispelling the notion that self transcendent experiences are somehow an indication of mental illness or i mean this is how it's long they've long been viewed that way freud thought that these experiences these oceanic experiences were neurotic returns to the womb Whatever the hell that means. I don't even know know what that means, but infantile regressions to the womb or whatever. I mean, this is how it's long been thought, but in his review paper, he shows quite clearly that these tend to be positive experiences. These tend to be experiences that are accompanied with love, with feelings of connection to the rest of humanity. You could also say that, you know, that we, we evolved these brains in order to navigate and survive a given environment. And that when we have these kinds of awe experiences where we can't comprehend the complexity of the world, but it's at the same time we see the beauty in it, right? Which we all relish and I think we all should should look for opportunities to have those experiences. But I think a cynical scientific perspective would be what's happening is we're pressing up against that which we can't comprehend and we're registering pleasure in this kind of, uh, this surrender. Like we're, 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 we're surrendering to the fact that our brains are unequal to the task of comprehending reality That's and human true. experience. But the fact that we're surrendering to our inability to comprehend does not necessarily mean that it's a, a moment of insight. It may, be a, it may be a moment of 
connection with other humans, which is a positive. But to some degree, you could make the case that this is like the static of a television that's losing signal or is overloaded with signal, right? That our circuits are overloading. Yeah, it's a great point. You really have to get outside your own frame of reference in order to experience all. You really show a shift in your own visual spatial uh, understanding of the relationship between yourself and the world as well. This has been shown by Andy Newberg's research on the neurology of people who are believers in God. He scanned their brains when they're thinking of God or or also just uh, deep meditators who are very experienced meditators. Yeah, there seems to be this this shift in the, in the visual spatial areas that uh, usually represent the self in relationship to the world. And when we have these moments, we really are having a profound shift. Sometimes LSD can do it quite easily without all the hard work, but I don't know. I think it could be open to debate to the extent to which one would only want to rely on drugs to get there. One of the notions, Scott, that I love in the book is that as we work our way up the hierarchy, and maybe that's not the right phrase, but as we let out our sails and become more connected with these higher level motivations and sense of connection, that we become more individuated. And at some point, there's the phrase, we become more idiosyncratically ourselves. You know, And I love that uh, notion because it, it's kind of, it's the opposite of Tolstoy's claim that happy families and by extension, happy people are all the same right? But unhappy ones are all unhappy in their own way. <laughs> that This kind of makes the case that actually like it is by getting to this sort of these higher level states of transcendence or, or being fully human that it becomes possible for us to become fully idiosyncratically ourselves. I, I, I really like that turn of phrase. Well, Maslow did see self-actualization as a process of becoming more and more idiosyncratically yourself. But Transcendence seems to be more and more about being connected to the rest of humanity um, via your most idiocratic self. So I, I think that the highest level of integration one could have is that what is good for your unique self is seamless from what is good from the, for the world. Can I ask you, Scott, in your journey, how is your hall right now? How is your sale? Is it unfurled? How how where where are you on this on this journey? Uh, I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. I I went from like being totally having my world completely turned upside down like when the pandemic like in April uh, May. Um, I think a lot of people can really resonate with that to acceptance and a real acceptance of the new normal for SBK, the notorious SBK, which it might not be bad. It might be better than the old SBK. I, I feel actually more unleashed lately than I ever have felt. I just go on Twitter and I say whatever I feel deep in my soul and it gets likes and that's exciting. You know, it's, this is, this is all any of us want is to, is to uh, be able to express the pure depths of our being. Yeah. And I'm on that journey and not fully there, obviously, but the more and more I work towards that goal, uh, the happier I tend to be. Yeah. For me, it was a revelatory journey reading your book, and I I'm so happy we were able to share it with, with more people through, through this podcast. So thank you so much for writing it and for being with us here today. Thanks, Rufus. I'm really appreciative uh, to be able to chat with you and, you know, to be continued. From Wondery, this is The Next Big Idea. And for the full Next Big Idea experience, including the opportunity to interact with great writers and thinkers like Scott Barry Kaufman, join the club at nextbigideaclub.com. It's a lively community of lifelong learners where you can get curated audio, video, and text summaries of the most groundbreaking new nonfiction direct from the authors. Sign up for three months free at nextbigideaclub.com slash podcast. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review and be sure to tell your friends. And I would personally love to hear your thoughts about this podcast, what you like, what we could do better, and what you'd like to learn about. Send me an email at my personal email address, rufus at nextbigideaclub.com. That's R-U-F-U-S at nextbigideaclub.com. 
Special thanks this week to the notorious SBK, Scott Barry Kaufman. His book, Transcend, The New Science of Self-Actualization, is available wherever books are sold. I'm your host, Rufus Griscom. This episode of The Next Big Idea was written by our associate producer, Caleb Bissinger. Sound designed by Jake Gorski. Our series producer is Michael Kovnat. Senior producer is Jonathan Miller. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.